All right, this is the third Midsummer Night's Dream lecture, and this is on the various complicated plots of Midsummer Night's Dream and how they interact with one another. First, let's just think about the title and how that might help us understand the plot. Um, it has the word dream in it. So what are dreams? Well, one useful way of thinking about dreams is to go all the way back to Sigmund Freud, who you've probably heard of, late 19th century, early 20th century psychoanalyst and considered by some to be the father of psychology. And according to Freud, and this is a theory that still many people, many people in psychology hold to, that dreams are at least in part a means of wish fulfillment. That is, the desires that we experience, sometimes unconscious desires that we can't or don't want to express, are fulfilled in our dreams because they can't be expressed through our waking life. This idea leads us to the question, whose wishes are being fulfilled? And of course, wishes can sometimes appear in negative ways because they might be dark wishes or uh, dangerous, disturbing desires that we don't want to admit to ourselves or that are socially unacceptable. So that's why they are unconscious. So whose wishes are being fulfilled in this play? Whose conscious wishes are being fulfilled and whose unconscious wishes are being fulfilled in terms of the characters? And then let's apply that same question to ourselves as the audience or to Shakespeare's original audience. How does the play fulfill our wishes? both our conscious wishes and our unconscious wishes. That is the things that we might not admit to ourselves that we want. And so really we're asking, what is it that we want in a story and why do we want it? This is really important when thinking about comedy because what is it that comedy is supposed to do? Well, comedy is supposed to please the audience and it's supposed to entertain us with a happy ending or what we consider to be a happy ending. And comedy also is supposed to show us the folly of human behavior, show us all the foolishness about humans in an amusing way so that we can learn from it but still enjoy it and laugh at ourselves a little bit. So again, thinking about wishes being fulfilled and how those wishes are fulfilled and whose wishes are not fulfilled, who gets a happy ending in this play and who doesn't? What are the costs of the happy endings that we see? Who has to pay for the happy endings? And who gets mocked in this play and who does the mocking? Who are the true fools? Is it just the comic relief characters or are the other characters exposed as foolish in some way? Before we look at some of the specifics, let's just review the general model that we looked at in a previous video, that we start this play in Athens, which is a city uh, of order and specifically patriarchal, that is male order, but there's conflict because some people don't want to follow the laws. Then we move into the forest where we experience both nature and the supernatural. And then finally, we return back to Athens, back to the city, where the order is restored and that restoration is demonstrated through marriage. And we can parallel this, a parallel way of understanding this uh, general plot trajectory is that we begin with love that's thwarted by the old law. The young love is thwarted by the older people. Then we move into a a place of chaos where things are unsettled, where things are transformed, but ultimately things are renewed. People's love, people's hopes, people's relationships are renewed. And then finally we go back to love now being fulfilled under the law instead of being thwarted by it. So keep this in mind as sort of general framework as we start looking at some of the specifics. So now let's get into the fun part, thinking about the plot. Let's look at the different plots and see how they interact. First, we have the Athenian nobility. 
Theseus and Hippolyta. And the main thing to keep in mind here is this is a plot of marriage through conquest. Theseus has defeated Hippolyta in battle, and that's why he's going to marry her. When we look at this plot visually and map it out, it's the simplest of all of them in a certain sense. Before the play, Theseus has done battle with and conquered Hippolyta. They tell us that at the very beginning. So the beginning of the play, they are preparing to get married. We don't see them through most of the plot. And then at the end, they are celebrating their marriage. The fairies are somewhat involved in this storyline in that we're told that Oberon has in the past had a fondness for Hippolyta, and Titania has in the past had a fondness for Theseus, but that's really left aside until we get to the end of the play when the fairies say that they're going to bless the beds of the newlyweds. However, we should keep in mind that Shakespeare's audience would have known about other stories involving Theseus, which go on to say that after his marriage to Hippolyta, she would later die and Theseus would remarry. So how happy of an ending do we really have? But that's the storyline of the Athenian nobility. And again, the most simple story and the one that sort of frames all the other action. Now, another way that we can look at this plot is to note that the Amazons, of course, are female warriors, a matriarchal society, women ruling women. So before the beginning of the play, we have a world in which the Amazons are independent of male rule. Theseus conquers them, conquers their queen, Hippolyta, and then at the end of this play, marries her. So where are we now? Where are the Amazons? Now they are under male authority by the end of the play. So we might think of that as an overarching theme and how does that apply to or inform the way we read the other plots in this story. Now we get to the fairies, Oberon and Titania, and they have, again, a somewhat straightforward storyline, comparatively speaking. There's a conflict between them over the Indian boy. Oberon uses Puck, his assistant, to trick Titania to enchant her, and then finally they are reconciled at the end of the play. Again, when we map it out, it's pretty simple, but there are a few more events that happen. Before the play, we know that Titania's follower has given birth to this boy and died, and we know that Oberon wants the child. So that sets us up for their conflict. At the beginning of the play, Oberon and Titania are fighting. And what happens is Oberon enchants Titania, and then we get our first crossover, major crossover, from one of the other plot lines in that Puck transforms Bottom. He does so not because Oberon tells him to, he just does so of his own accord, but it figures into Oberon's plan anyway, as Titania falls in love with Bottom, and we're told that because of this, she gives up the child to Oberon in what I'm calling an unseen, because it's a scene that's described, but we never actually see it. So after Titania gives the child to Oberon, he releases her from her spell. She's no longer in love with Bottom, and they reconcile, and again, the fairies bless the newlyweds. So a more, slightly more complicated storyline, a few more events happen, but still fairly linear. We also have an alternative way of looking at the fairies story. We begin with the women in control of the children. Titania is raising the child of her votress, the woman who was her follower. Oberon wants the child, so he enchants her, and she falls in love with Bottom, of course, with Puck's help. Bottom then replaces the child, so Titania gives her to Oberon. And where do we end up? with the men in control of the child. Oberon now has the child as one of his followers to be his knight. And now we can reconcile. He can release her from her spell. She no longer loves Bottom, but seems to have forgotten about the child and is now reconciled with Oberon 
thankful that she's been released from her uh, dream of loving a monster. And now we get into the fun stuff, the young lovers and their very complex storyline. And this is not just a love triangle, but a love quadrangle. And it's one that transforms multiple times in the play. And again, the basic theme here that Shakespeare's audience would have understood, it's a very traditional storyline. We've got young love that's in conflict with paternal desires. So we're going to need a number of slides to go through this one. At the start of the play, we have this basic setup. Hermia and Lysander are in love with each other. But Hermia's father, Aegeus, prefers Demetrius to Lysander. He wants her to marry Demetrius. So we've got Demetrius who says he's in love with Hermia. But then there's our fourth character, Helena, who is in love with Demetrius and who we find out Demetrius used to love. He used to, to have a thing for Helena, but now he's abandoned her for Hermia. So we have this complex setup of interrelationships and conflicts from the very beginning. So what happens? Well, Aegeus goes to Theseus who enforces his will. He says, you have to marry Demetrius. So what happens? Hermia and Lysander, they flee to the forest. They say, we're getting out of here so we can be in love and get married. We're leaving Athens. Let's go to the forest and escape. Helena, for some reason, decides to tell Demetrius about this. She says, they've left, even though you would think this would give her the opportunity to have Demetrius to herself. But she tells Demetrius, who decides to follow Hermia and Lysander, and of course, then Helena follows after Demetrius. So we have them all fleeing into the woods in pursuit of their various loves. And in the forest is where things start to get crazy. Oberon observes Demetrius and Helena. He thinks Demetrius is being so cruel to her because she's in love with him. And he says, Puck, go enchant this guy, make him fall in love with Helena. Puck, however, first enchants Lysander. Perhaps mistakenly, he says it was an accident. Perhaps he does it on purpose. We don't really know. That's up to the director of the play to decide. So Puck enchants Lysander, who then falls in love with Helena. Oberon realizes his mistake. He says, go enchant the right guy. So Puck then enchants Demetrius, who also falls in love with Helena. We can see already how this is causing lots of problems. So what happens as a result of this enchantment and Lysander and Demetrius now both loving Helena? Well, they begin to fight over Helena. They argue over who loves her more. And of course, Lysander at the same time rejects his love for Hermia and says he hates her. And in a complementary development, Hermia and Helena now have conflict. They begin to fight over Lysander. Well, really, Hermia is angry with Helena over Lysander. Helena doesn't want Lysander, but they do have a conflict. So we can see that the initial chaotic relationships and interactions are getting even more chaotic by this point. And of course, Helena thinks that all three of them are mocking her. She doesn't believe that Lysander and Demetrius really love her. She thinks it's a joke, even though, of course, this is the fulfillment of her desire for Demetrius. And she thinks that Hermia is one of their confederacy, that she is joined with the two men in mocking her. And she is rather upset by this. And how do we begin the resolution? Well, at Oberon's insistence, Puck enchants all four of them, causing all four of them to go to sleep. And as we'll see in the next slide, Puck then uh, releases Lysander from his enchantment so that he goes back to loving Hermia. So Puck once again steps in with his magic, the magic that caused the problem in the first place, to now resolve the problem. 
Again, Oberon has ordered Puck to fix the thing, so after he enchants them all to fall asleep, he then releases Lysander, and this begins the return to Athens. Theseus finds the four lovers. Lysander has been released from his enchantment and has fallen back in love with Hermia. Demetrius, however, has not been released from his enchantment, so he is still in love with Helena. And Theseus finds them all, seeing that they have all paired up and there's no more conflict, he now says, Aegeus, I overrule your will and I'm going to allow them all to get married. Even though he said at the beginning of the play that he couldn't overrule Aegeus' will because the law said Aegeus had control of his daughter, but now he says, well, things have seem to have uh, uh, fallen together so nicely that I will let them marry whom they wish. Now let's look at this just in a slightly different way, look at their storyline in slightly different terms. At the start of the play, again, we have the various love relationships, but let's look at the same-sex relationships. The two men, Lysander and Demetrius, are rivals, and they're rivals over Hermia. The two women, Hermia and Helena, are friends. They are friends with each other, but Helena does reveal that she feels some jealousy towards Hermia because of how much Demetrius loves her. So we have rivalry and a friendship, but a friendship that is marred by some secret jealousy. What is it that happens in the forest when Puck enchants everyone? Well, everything sort of inverts. Lysander and Demetrius are still rivals, but now they're rivals over Helena instead of over Hermia. Hermia and Helena, who were friends, now their friendship is broken. Remember that Helena thinks that everyone's mocking her. She doesn't believe that the two men are really in love with her, and she thinks that Hermia has joined with them to mock her. So the two women's friendship is broken, and Hermia is now jealous of Helena because of Lysander, because the man who used to love her now loves Helena. So everything sort of switches around. The forest is this crazy mirror image version of the conflicts in Athens. So what is the nature of the resolution then? It's not just that Lysander and Hermia are in love with each other and Demetrius and Helena are in love with each other. Sure, that's important. But another way to read the, the resolution of the play is that the friendship between this, the, the members of the same sexes is restored. Lysander and Demetrius are no longer rivals. And it's really that lack of rivalry that enables the happy ending. And Hermia and Helena are no longer rivals. Their friendship is restored. Although we might argue that that's less important than the two men's friendship being restored, given that this is a patriarchal culture in which this is all taking place. So the point here that I'm making is that we can see this plot as doing multiple things. There's, of course, the confusion of love and the switching of love objects, the men loving first Hermia, then Helena. But we can also see it as a plot in which the rivalry between the men needs to be diffused so that they each have their own woman rather than wanting the same woman. Finally, we have the workers, the rude mechanicals, as Puck calls them, and their plot. We know from the beginning they're planning to perform. They're going to do a play for the royal wedding because they want to get some financial reward. They think this will get them money, even though they are, as we see, terrible actors. Bottom is transformed, and he has his relationship with Titania that we've always already talked about. He's transformed back, and then they finally perform their play before all the newlyweds, the tragedy of Pyramus and Thisbe, which is a tragedy of young love gone wrong. So let's look at their plot and how it maps out. Well, we start with the workers planning a play for the royal wedding, and they decide to go and rehearse in the forest. 
because they don't want people to see what they're going to do. They don't want people to know their play and what they've got planned beforehand. So they go to the forest to rehearse. Puck happens upon them and transforms Bottom, turns him into an ass, gives him an ass's head, that is a donkey's head. And this, of course, then leads to Titania falling in love with him because she's been enchanted by Oberon. Oberon then releases Titania after she gives up the child. She falls out of love with Bottom. Puck releases Bottom from his spell, and they go back to the city and they perform for the newlyweds. So interestingly enough, their story, although the most silly in some sense, also, at least Bottom's story, intersects with all of the other plots. Without Bottom, Titania and Oberon wouldn't have their plot released, and there wouldn't be the celebratory performance for the newlyweds to all bond over and laugh. So in an interesting way, Bottom is the glue that holds the whole play together. And of course, we can plot out this story another way, particularly if we focus on Bottom. We begin with them, again, they desire royal reward. They want to be made men, as they say. So that's why they want to perform in front of Theseus's wedding. Puck transforms Bottom, which is a lowering of his status because he's transformed into a monster. He's given an ass's head, a donkey's head. But at the same time as Bottom is transformed into something more animalistic and less human, he's also raised high into society because now he becomes the lover of the Queen of the Fairies, this supernatural monarch. So Bottom's status is lowered and then raised at the same time. Of course, after everything goes on with Titania and Oberon, Bottom is rejected and it's a precipitous fall. He's rejected and thrust back into the real world, released from his enchantment, and he becomes Bottom the Weaver again. And finally, what happens? They are rewarded by Theseus. They perform and they're rewarded, but they're still workers. They're still who they are, despite their reward. Finally, let's look at some questions that we can consider. What patterns do you see occurring and reoccurring in the various plots? So look for parallels, contrasts, reversals, unexpected twists, and see how the, the patterns shape the plot, how the plots, even though they're very complex and confusing, when we step back and look at them from a bird's eye view, from a global view, we can start to see some meaning, some logic there. And when looking at these patterns, what themes or larger ideas are suggested? I've given you some uh, indications that at least some of the themes that we see are the themes of women's power, women's authority being rejected, and then women being placed under the authority of men. So how does the storyline, how does the plot enforce or communicate a certain cultural value or idea about gender? Building on questions that I've asked earlier, think about how the different plots compare and contrast with one another. Uh, how does one story comment on or reflect another? We might consider, for example, the storyline of Titania and Oberon and compare that with the storyline of Theseus and Hippolyta. What are the similarities? What are the similar types of events that occur? Or how does the story of Bottom and his courtship and the play that they ultimately perform at the end of Pyramus and Thisbe, how does that comment on and reflect what happens with the young lovers? And what other interactions can you find between the storylines? I've given you some, shown you how, for example, Puck is involved in pretty much every storyline, and how Bottom himself also crosses from storyline to storyline. Are there other direct or indirect interactions that you can find, and how do the storylines affect each other? Also, we want to think about plot and character. How do the plots, how are the plots shaped by the characters? That is, what aspects of their personality, of their beliefs, of their values affect or determine how the action unfolds? What about the characters' 
uh, do we see, um, how do they reveal themselves in their actions? And vice versa, how do the plots shape or transform the characters? So what effect do the characters have on the plot? What effect do the plots have on the characters? Are they changed by what happens to them? Who is changed and who isn't? And are they changed for the better or for the worse? And this is a question that might vary depending both on gender and the class of the characters. So which characters are the most important to the story and why? Who has the most effect, positive or negative, on the other characters and on the other storylines? Obviously, Puck is extremely important, but so is Bottom but they're important in very different ways. Theseus and Oberon are, of course, very important as the patriarchs, the male rulers of the play, but how are their female consorts, their female counterparts, also important? And again, what actions by the characters have, have an effect on others and which characters are the most affected by the others? To return to another question that I asked earlier, what does a happy ending mean? What are the values that determine what counts as happy? And of course, happy for whom? Is a happy ending the same for men as it is for women? Is a happy ending the same for the high class characters as it is for the lower class characters? And who has to suffer to ensure the happy ending? Is it happy for everyone? And are there characters that might even be unhappy and not realize it? So what are the costs of the happy ending? Is it just everything's perfect, everything's rosy, or are there lingering problems, lingering doubts, lingering challenges? And to build on that question and to really bring it to its most important point, why is marriage the defining characteristic of a happy ending? In Shakespeare's time, a comedy meant an ending with a marriage. And today, even how, think about how many comedies today end with marriage or the equivalent uh, relationship, if not explicitly marriage. What does this say about our ideas regarding gender and sexuality? What does this say about the values we have about happiness and how marriage fits into our notions, our cultural ideas of what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to act and what's supposed to happen to us? And what does it say about our expectations for men and for women? Are they different and why are they different? And finally, take this to modern values. How would you change this play to reflect modern values? What would be different? Who would be different? What would remain the same in this play in order to make it modern? You might be surprised at how much of it remains the same. You might also be surprised at the things that would be different and how different they might be. So think about this, particularly for this week's writing assignment. The final step is to watch the Midsummer Moon Tracing an Image video, and in that video I use the Shakespeare Concordance to look for all the moments in the play where Shakespeare uses the word moon or a related word like moonlight, uh, and in order to explore how one very specific image can transform and mean different things across the play as it's spoken by different characters in different contexts with different events. So this is uh, an extension from an example of last week's writing assignment where you were to do the same thing with the Shakespeare Concordance, find an image in Much Ado About Nothing and examine how it develops over the course of the play. If you have questions, you can of course email, call or text and post to the discuss or post to the discussion board on Blackboard. I look forward to hearing from you. If you have any questions, let me know and best wishes with your work for this week.